Hi, it's Ray. Welcome to my channel and to my wrap-up of the books that I read in April this year. This book's reading wrap-up is really an ode to audiobooks. I had a super busy month in April. I read honestly hardly anything in physical copy and yet I still got through seven books and that is due to two things. One of them being like a few, the few days of holiday that I had at the beginning of the month in which I did a lot of actual reading and the other one just being that I listen to audiobooks in all of my spare time and I love them, they brought me so much joy and I managed to still feel like I was reading in a month where I wasn't actually able to sit down with a book very often. Because I've been doing reading vlogs and things, a few of these books I feel like I've talked about a lot so I'll try and give quick reviews if I've kind of already banged on about them in another context and give slightly more detailed reviews if I'm talking about something new. I'm going to start off with classics. I finally finished Leo Tolstoy's Childhood Boyhood Youth. This was for the Dickens vs Tolstoy book club which Emmy and Carolyn Marie Reed's channels are hosting. This was their book for January, obviously didn't finish it until April, um, I've kind of fallen off the wagon with that book club, even though I do still intend to read the year's worth of books over the course of this year because I'm going to have more time like in the summer holidays and stuff to catch up on the big classics that I've got behind on. Anyway, Childhood Boyhood Youth is not an autobiographical book but it reads like a memoir and it's the story of its protagonist Nika Linka, a young boy living in very privileged class circumstances in Russia and his kind of day-to-day -day experiences from childhood up to the age of about 18. In that sense, it's a coming-of-age novel. This was Tolstoy's debut work and it's actually unfinished, which I totally didn't realise until I got to the end of it. The point that Emma makes in the live stream where her and Carolyn talk about the book is that it does quite detract from your sort of satisfaction as a reader, reading this book because it's unfinished, fairly obviously, just because an unfinished book is always a little bit frustrating, but also because you lose the narrative arc that you normally get in a coming of age story where you get the kind of satisfaction and joy of the character having developed and made moral progress by the end of the book. What actually happens with Nikolinka is he kind of just like morally degenerates from childhood up until youth and then even though he tells you that later on in his adulthood he becomes a better person you never see that and so he ends up being quite a frustrating character to spend time with. I liked a lot about this book emotionally Tolstoy really effectively got under the skin of what it feels like to be a child. He did a fantastic analysis of the kind of disconnect between what goes on in our mental world and how we act in our physical world, of the challenges of perfectionism. So Nikolinka, the main character, is a real perfectionist and this leads him to kind of have these lofty ideas in his mind which never get displayed in reality at all. And of the interactions between social classes, we see Nikolinka increasingly falling into this quite repellent upper middle class mindset where he really looks down on the servants who work with him, where he feels himself to be superior than other boys at the university, etc, etc. And Tolstoy definitely writes this in a way which implies critique. It did take me four months to read, so as you can probably tell, this was not a book that I absolutely loved. It was the kind of book that I had an awful lot of underlined quotes in, but didn't necessarily love the whole experience of reading it. I find with Tolstoy, and this might be sacrilegious to say, but for me, when he's good, he's very, very good, and when he's bad, he's boring. And Tolstoy really, and he has this reputation, for people who haven't read him, as, of being a boring author. Largely just because Anna Karenina and War and Peace are so long, which is not at all the equivalent thing to boring. But in both Anna Karenina and War and Peace, he goes off on these long, lengthy, and frankly, boring to me, diversions. They might be like historical, they might be philosophical, but they're definitely off piece from the plot and I am not a fan. Some people like them, but I am not a fan. That wasn't the way that this book was boring. Boring is a harsh word, although I would genuinely apply it to like Levin's farming in Anna Karenina and to most of the war in War and Peace. However, in Childhood Boyhood Youth, it was just the case that the plot wasn't that strong, the character wasn't that likeable, and when I was away from the book, I really just had no sense of curiosity as to what was going to happen next, or how the plot or the character was going to develop, because I wasn't that invested in anybody, and the plot wasn't really much of a plot, so that's why it took me such a long time to read. But I'm glad that I read it, it is definitely worth reading in its own right, even though it is unfinished, it's not kind of drastically unfinished, like you still have the sense that you've read a decent 300 page novel, and for a debut piece of writing it is pretty incredible, Tolstoy is an amazing author. I critique him, but I also adore him. For me, nobody else compares to Tolstoy at his best, and I will totally take getting a bit fed up and getting a bit frustrated with him in parts of his work for the kind of almost ecstasy that his writing can bring when it's really good. 
Okay, moving into the adult fiction that I read this month. I listened to an audiobook called The Yellow Bird Sings, which is by Jennifer Rosner. I got recommended this by my fiance's mum, who is also an avid reader, and we talk about books together a lot. She said she listened to it on audiobook and she just could not stop listening to it. It was so addictive. She really highly recommended it. It was happily on offer on Audible, so I just bought it, started listening to it, and I had the exact same experience. I ended up listening to about two thirds of the book in one sitting, and I, I literally like lost an evening to it. It was like I was watching a film, like I didn't do anything, I just sat in a chair listening to this audiobook. It's a story about Jews in Poland in the Second World War. It starts off with a mother and her daughter in a barn having to be silent because they are hiding, and the little girl is only five years old, the mother herself I think is only about 26, they've lost the rest of their family and they're in hiding in this barn, it's 1941. And the little girl Shira, whose name means song, is a musical prodigy. Shira has all of this music inside her which is expressed through this imaginary yellow bird that's like her imaginary friend which is constantly singing and which is also just irrepressibly noisy in the face of the silent life that this tiny child has to lead. As you would imagine by the subject matter this is not at all a jolly book. Trigger warnings for rape, for miscarriage, for violence, for grief. It's a deeply moving novel and yet somehow even though the issues that it explores are also dark and so heartbreakingly sad. It is a novel throughout which there is beauty and hope and I really like the way that Rosner has this title and this imaginary bird, the yellow bird sings. To me it just harks back to the Emily Dickinson poem, Hope is a Thing with Feathers, because I think that hope is an emotion that runs throughout this novel, especially as Rosner dedicates this novel to and explores the history of the lost children of World War II, so Jewish children who end up separated from their families for whatever reason during the course of the war, who then faced enormous hardships to get back together with their parents post-war because everybody was so scattered and nobody had any real way of tracing people and children have and had to change their names multiple times in order to be safe during the war and yeah it's just like it was phenomenally moving it was really well written i would highly recommend it a much much lighter fictional read that i also listened to on audiobook and also really enjoyed was the cashmere shawl by rosie thomas this is a women's commercial fiction kind of work and it's a genre that i don't read very much of but watching booktube kind of has given me the kick that i need to realize that i should just branch out and read some of genres that i suspect that i'm going to enjoy the cashmere shawl was kind of multi-generational book with two narrative perspectives. The first one being Mare, who is a modern day young woman. We first see packing up the possession in her parents' house after her father has died and they are getting the house and they're moving out all of the old possessions, ready to sell the house on. She's kind of in her thirties, she's single, she's at this sort of crux point in her life where she's not really sure what she's doing with her life, she doesn't really feel like she's got a direction, like she's necessarily achieved that much with her life compared to her siblings who are sort of married and in high-flying careers. And she comes across this beautiful cashmere shawl in one of the drawers that also has a photograph in it and works out that this shawl belonged to her grandmother who was a missionary's wife in India during the Second World War and she decides to go to India to try and research the history of this shawl and find out more about her grandmother who she didn't really know very much about. That's our kind of first perspective and it follows her journey of self-discovery and also of historical discovery. A lot of the story and I'd say kind of the main part of the story and definitely the most enjoyable bit follows the life of the grandmother Neris Watkins and her experience of being a missionary's wife in India during the Second World War, being caught in multiple kind of weird cruxes, so like especially initially living in peace while her country is at war, being the wife of a missionary but gradually realising that she doesn't necessarily really love him and she's also not really sure that his mission is achieving anything of any benefit, she's not really sure how she feels about religion anymore, and it's about the friendships that she creates, and particularly the female friendships that she creates, and that is where I think this novel really, really excelled. It had lines in it like, I'm not sure I knew how to be me until I met you. And that was not said to a lover, that was said to a female friend, as I really liked this one. The unromantic truth about romance is that it is flimsy. Don't make it your sole support because it will not bear your weight. I just felt like I had a very mature approach to relationships and to what relationships really mean to women and to what relationships are really important to women, i.e. Female to female friendships matter. There is more to life than just romance. Romance takes different forms and partnerships mean different things to romantic relationships and flings. And the way that you feel passionately about somebody that you're in love with when you're 17 is very different to the way that you might love somebody when you're 27. And I just felt it explored all of these things really well. It was not like a particularly deep or clever story, but the plot kept me interested and it really felt like a book that was written for women. And I don't think I read enough 
books that feel like they're written for women so I really enjoyed that. I would read more by Rosie Thomas. On to children's literature next. I finished the last two novels in the Hetty Feather series by Jacqueline Wilson. I read the first three of them maybe last month, maybe the month before. If you've been following my journey with Hetty Feather, I absolutely adored the first novel. I absolutely loved the second one. I was like, this is the best series ever. And then the third one was just kind of meh. It was kind of all right. Diamond, the fourth one, is the novel that I was super annoyed about because Wilson changes the narrative voice in this novel. And we switch from having Hetty being the narrator to this young girl at a circus called Diamond, who is very much a little child. I think she's maybe like eight, whereas Hetty by this point is kind of about 14. And so had definitely had a much more mature voice. We switch to Diamond and her story, and we hear the story of this little girl Diamond from her childhood in London, living in poverty, living with an abusive father who actually sells her to the circus, and then about the kind of traumatic time that she has being a circus child and being forced to work. And from a historical fiction perspective, it's actually really interesting. Given that I went into this novel really like begrudging its existence because I just wanted another Hattie book and I was super annoyed that it wasn't another Hattie book even though Hattie does feature in it like she is a character in the novel but she's not the main character in the novel um, I enjoyed it more than I expected to. I didn't love it, like mostly it was just fine. I really liked some of the stuff that happened at the end, like I liked the way that they looked at the hardships and the cruelty of employment during Victorian times, both to children but also to the elderly, to, like the lack of pension, to women in particular's complete dependence on men in order to have enough money to live, like that was really well done. Um, but I felt also the whole thing was packaged up in a way that made it very child-friendly, I think. Had I read it as a child, this would probably have actually been my favourite of the Hattie novels. I love kind of performance books, the performance side of the circus, it's always exciting. It was fun. And then I moved into Little Stars, which is the last book in the Hattie Feather series. And thank goodness, I loved it. It was just totally back to everything that I had loved in the earlier books. I don't want to talk about the plot too much because it, if you haven't read the series at all then it will obviously give things away but to give a little bit of a plot overview of the series they're following this girl Hetty Feather in a kind of current coming of age arc. As a child in the first book we see her brought up as an orphan in the Foundling Hospital in London and it then goes on to look at her life after she leaves the Foundling Hospital and at her experience of really trying to find her identity and trying to find her place in the world from this sort of harsh position of having been looked down upon during her upbringing and having missed out on a lot of the normal love that a child would be able to receive. In the final book of the series she is about 15 years old so she's actually still not really old. This definitely isn't a coming of age novel that goes right up to adulthood but it does show I felt really effectively how Hetty continues to make progress but also how the wounds of the past stay with her. We see in this novel that even though she's still a really likeable and lovable character she also has some super annoying traits like she becomes increasingly selfish. She's just got way too much responsibility for a 15 year old girl and she doesn't really know how to handle it and sometimes she just handles it completely in the wrong way and you just you really recognize that she's never quite had the opportunity to be a child. She had the weight of the world on her shoulders for the whole series. You know how sometimes a character just like completely fulfills a personality test type? I think she's such an Enneagram 4, whatever that one is where you just want self-expression and you want to be individual and unique and we see Hetty kind of fighting to be this utter individual even when that's actually damaging to herself and to those around her and when conforming is actually rationally the right option but it's almost like because she was so repressed as a child and she attended this institution that forced her to be like everybody else when she desperately wanted to present her individuality she just makes these kind of irrational choices later on in life and yeah I thought that was really clever the way that it was portrayed. We also get a number of characters from the earlier books kind of return to this one the whole thing just kind of ties up really nicely from my perspective a lot of the plots went where I kind of wanted them to go which was wonderful and like where I wanted them to go might not be where another reader wanted them to go. I think this is the kind of book where different readers will have affiliations with different characters. It was also nice that this child wonder diamond, it was nice how that then tied into the fifth novel in a way that totally made sense and made it feel like it was a worthwhile book, not just a spin-off. So overall I was really happy with the series and I'm so happy to be happy with the series because it started so well, kind of dipped in the middle and I was worried that I was not going to love it but I'm glad that I pursued it to the end. I really enjoyed them, great modern children's books, great historical fiction for children but also for adults, good enough and grown up enough that you could enjoy it properly as an adult. Okay, then a couple of non-fictions to finish off with. The first one being the essay by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, We Should All Be Feminists. This is a written adaptation of a TED talk that she gave on the topic of feminism. It's a very well-structured essay speech, which 
really just lays out the law of why feminism is important and some kind of key arguments for it. It's incredibly short, it literally took me 20 minutes to read. I think if you're already on board with feminism, it doesn't necessarily cover any new ground, but there's definitely some wonderful quotes in there that you'd find yourself underlining. And it's interesting that she compares and contrasts the experiences of being a woman in Nigeria to being a woman in London, and looking at how feminism is important in both of those contexts, but how different parts of the world are in very different places in terms of how far along the feminism route they have progressed. Very quick read, but good. Would especially recommend for like a 16, 17, 18 year old, I think it would have impacted me in a positive way a lot at that age. Reading in my late 20s, it didn't feel like it was opening my eyes to anything new in the way that it totally would have done had I read it when I was younger. And then the last thing that I read in April, and this is the only thing I have a hard copy of. I told you I read a lot of audiobooks. Anyway, it is this cringy cover, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity by David Allen. This is, was, kind of like my comfort self-help book. I read it a few years ago when I was really stressed and overwhelmed. I found the system in here really helpful, quite reassuring, and even now I find the book quite empowering. Like I read this and I think, I can take charge of my own life, I can sort things out myself, I don't have to feel so stressed and overwhelmed, I just need to get a better grip on my projects and make some more lists and that kind of thing. The thing that's the massive issue with it is like, look how long it is, and the central concept to it could be summarized on like, one side of A4. I know this is a problem with so many self-help books that they just really bulk themselves out unnecessarily and this one definitely, definitely does that. I remember the first time that I read it I quite enjoyed the experience of reading it whereas on a reread I did not really enjoy the experience of rereading it. Occasionally I felt quite motivated by the language. I think when you're trying to be productive and when you're reading a self-help book it's quite nice to always just get that little boost of motivation that you get from actually being with the text but honestly it's so badly written. It's quite cringy in places how terribly written it is. So I will probably, probably not be rereading it again. Although I think I will still keep my edition of it because this is why I love hard copies of books. I find this physical copy hideous as it is. I still find I'm quite emotionally attached to it because I do remember that this book really helped me and gave me a lot of strength when I was feeling just so overwhelmed with teaching that I was like, I can't do this. I'm just like useless. I don't have control of my life. And it helped me to get in control enough to cope. I don't think you ever get on top of your to-do list when you're a teacher or to be honest, when you're just like a human being in modern society, because there's always too much to do. But it is helpful sometimes to fall into a structure and to have somebody telling you that you can do it and that you are capable and that it is possible to achieve a state where you're not stressed out. So yeah, that's my final read. Bit random. Bit of an eclectic reading month as per usual. I do think I read quite a random range of books and being on booktube definitely makes me more conscious of what a random range of books I read. It does mean that when I do my wrap ups, they cover some random stuff. So sorry if you were not interested in it. I do always split it up into chapters talking about the different books so that if there's some you're really not interested in, you can just skip over and like, please, I will not be offended if you skip over some of my random reads and just like focus on whatever genre or category you're interested in yourself. Anyway, those are my April reads. I'm super excited for my next reading month because I'm following along with Katie from Books and Things' month-long read-along, 1900 to 1950, so I'm reading exclusively literature written between 1900 and 1950. I've got some books I'm really, really looking forward to on my TBR, and I think that May is going to be a really fun reading month, so I look forward to telling you about all the books that I read during the month of May. I hope that you found something to your taste during my random April reads. I hope that you have a fantastic reading month coming up. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.